As you see, uh, some of our team is away, and Amy and Ted led worship yesterday and this morning, so thank you for your faithfulness these two days and leading songs and ushering us into the presence of the Lord through music. There was a woman who took her husband, uh, he had been feeling ill, and he, she took him uh, to the doctor's office. <clears throat> And the doctor examined her husband and came back into the room, and he said to the two of them, you are very sick. The husband was hard of hearing, and he turned to his wife and said, what did he say? She said, he said you're very sick. Oh, okay, got it. So the doctor said, but there is hope. If you will go home and relieve his stress, if, if you will fix him the very best breakfast every morning, if you will fix his favorite for lunch and for dinner, um, if you will actually every day look the best that you can and try to just whatever his whims are, cater to those, there's hope. And the man turned to his wife and said, what did he say? <laughs> she said, he said you're going to die. <laughs> you know, when I guess the worst thing for being sick is when you have no hope. The good thing is when it comes to our lives and eternal life, we have hope in Jesus Christ. Paul has spent an enormous, a lot of time in these first verses, these chapters, as we've got into Romans, into this sermon series, telling us how sinful we are. And he doesn't just uh, choose the Jews and say, oh, the Jews have failed and they're sinful, or the Gentiles have failed and they're sinful. No, he just tells us all that we are just guilty as you know what in the eyes of God, because we all have sinned. And so there's very little denying that truth. In fact, I would challenge you, and some of you probably have done this, there's been, uh, I've not traveled outside of the United States other than being on a ship that went to the Bahamas, and I don't count that as travel. So some of you have been to other countries, and you've turned on the TV, or you've picked up the newspaper, and when you do that, you find that in those countries, regardless of size, whether it's China or whether it is India, who I think are still the largest populations uh, to leading the world, or the very smallest country, you pick up the newspaper and you read it and it looks like ours. There is death, there is evil, there is crime going on, there is murder going on, there is infidelity. Anything that you think you might not see that you see here, you can see everywhere else. Man is sinful. In these verses that we're going to look at today, in just a moment, it's going to give us an understanding of where sin originated from. Give us an understanding of what it means to be sinful. And if all of us were honest with ourselves today and I hope we would be, we would say that at some point in our life, and even after coming to faith in Jesus Christ, there are times when our desires and our thoughts have not been pure. There are times when our thoughts and desires have not been righteous. And if we had allowed ourselves to follow those desires and those thoughts we could have or would most likely ruined marriages or careers or our finances, our name, maybe even our fellowship in the way it should be with our Lord. We have all had sinful thoughts. And sadly, there are many that act upon them. There are many, even when they know the consequences of those actions, of that temptation that comes, and even they, though they know 
the consequences. They still do things that are wicked before the eyes of our Lord. Why? Well, therein lies the answer, and that is original sin. The doctrine of original sin is that man is a sinner by nature. By very nature, man is a sinner. He does not become a sinner by doing evil. Rather, man does evil because he is a sinner. And you will see that line again in a few minutes. There's a, another name for this, and in the, the, the line of Calvinism, it's called total depravity. It means that we have a nature that is totally deprived. And basically, it teaches us that all mankind is born evil, and there is no good in them. And you say, well, where does the Scripture say that? Well, we have already studied that. If you were to go back to Romans 3, and you were to begin with verse 10, it says, and it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There are none who understand. There is none who seek for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. The Apostle John in his first letter tells us, if we say we're without sin, we count God as a liar. And there's no good in us. And so in these verses, as we look at these verses this morning, we're going to look at four R words, and hopefully that will help you to remember. But before I read the passage, I want to remind you that it was not that way. This sinful man was not the way it began. It began good and righteous. In fact, Genesis 1.26 says that man was created by God and created in the image of God and was placed in the garden which was perfect. And there was only one command that was given to man. And that was, don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Only command. So man and his perfect mate, woman, lived in a perfect garden without sin. They were not born in sin. Not at all. But sin came into the world through one man. Turn, if you have your Bibles, to Romans chapter 5, and let's look at these three verses this morning as we begin to unpack this text. Paul says, Therefore, just as one man's sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Illuminate our hearts and minds this morning, Father, for what you would hold for us through this, your holy word. We pray this in your name. Amen. The first R word is roots, the roots of sin. From the perfect beginning to the pitiful failure, the study of sin's effect on the human race is a study of tragedy, it is a study of death. Sin had its origins in the heart of Lucifer. If you were to jot these verses down and read them later, Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15, you will see that Lucifer, a created being, was not uh, content to be 
just an angel of the Lord. He wanted to ascend higher. He wanted his throne to be above and higher than God, and Lucifer sinned against God. But his sin at that time had no effect on humanity. I want you to hear that. His sin at that time had no effect on humanity when he sinned against God. That effect is going to come later. So sin entered the human family, mankind, by the actions of Adam. He had been created in the very image of God, the perfect environment, the perfect uh, companion. He was the master and put in charge of the entire world. And that only restriction came from the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The penalty Jesus or God gave to him was if you eat of this tree, you will die. And if you look at the fall of man, if you look at the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent, Satan who comes and tempts, it is here that the Satan, in the form of a serpent, says, Did God really say? Did, did God, he, he didn't mean that. Oh, no, you're not going to die if you eat the fruit. And what we see in Genesis 3, I mentioned last week, we see shame come in as Adam and Eve sinned against God, as they broke the command, as they were disobedient. Shame came into play. Shame that they were naked, though they had been naked before. Now they were ashamed. Guilt came into play. Fear came into play. Now they had fear of what they had done against God. They knew that they had wronged. They had done wrong against what God had commanded. Blame came into existence. God, this woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit. It's her fault, God. It's not mine. Death and separation. For you see, God was true. When God told Adam, you will surely die, he was factual. It was true. And man was separated from God. I wonder if we had been there that day. If we had been watching, would bells and whistles have gone off? Maybe we would have said, stop, 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 stop. Don't do that. You heard what God said. Or we would have just been as complacent as Adam and Eve at the temptation of being just like God. Wasn't that the temptation? If you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. In the moment that Adam sinned, it has been termed by theologians the fall of mankind. And sadly enough, as temptation by Satan to Adam and Eve, this effect did not just affect them, but it affected all of mankind ever to be born. When you look at verse 12 in this passage, you look and it says, Sin entered the world. Through one man, sin entered into the world. And so, this began the fall. This was a world that would fall apart. A world that would be now, as you look at the fall of mankind, there's only one way to explain murder or abortion or theft or lying or racism or hatred, and you can continue fornication, adultery, idolatry, wickedness, sexual immorality, and let the the list keep going. All of it, it came out of 
sin entering the world, the root of sin came through the fall of man through Adam. It's the only way to explain how a mother can kill her children and say, I just didn't want them anymore. They're kind of cramping my lifestyle. We see it as evil, which it is. It's the only way to explain, the fall of man is the only way to explain abortion. Who in their right mind would kill an unborn child? But yet it's done for profit? It's interesting to me that the abortion industry says that a child in a mother's womb is not a human being, but yet they harvest those organs of an unborn child? It's not a human being? How can we explain all of the atrocities that we see Life not having value in our society. How could we even explain that without understanding the root of sin? Sin entered the world, and it was by one man's sin. All sin, all the results of sin, can be tracked back to that moment in time. That moment, as Paul reminds us, Adam the first man sinned against God. That is the root of all sin. And then the next R word is the reality of sin. So we move from the root of sin to the reality of sin. How does that sin, how does Adam's sin affect me? How does it affect us right now in my life, in your life where we live? I want you to notice that last phrase of verse 12, and it says, all have sinned. Couldn't be any plainer. All. You can put a capital A, two capital L's. All have sinned. And this verse is not saying that all men are sinners, even though they are. It's not saying that um, all men commit sin, though we do. The proper understanding of this verse, as you look at it, is the tense of Sinned. Notice it's past tense. We all sinned before we even got here. Hear that again. We all sinned before we even got here. Basically what Paul is saying is when Adam sinned, you and I sinned. When Adam disobeyed God, you and I disobeyed God. When Adam fell, our very nature fell. Someone has said when Adam fell, every person bruised their knees. But I think it's more important, it's more serious than that. I think when Adam sinned, we all died spiritually. To understand this, we need to understand that Adam, the first man, is the trace back from our lineage to his. Adam is the first man. Every person, every lineage from there comes from Adam. And Adam was given authority over all the human race. And therefore, when Adam sinned, the reality is that we all sinned. We all had this sinful condition as we were born in our mother's womb. As humanity, the bloodstream from Adam to us, to me, we inherited this awful virus of sin and death. Look at it this way. If Adam was driving a bus and all of humanity was on that bus forever and ever, amen, and Adam is driving that bus and he drives it off a cliff, we're all going with him. You don't get to escape it. If you are born of woman and there is no one watching this or in this place that is not born of woman, We are all born 
The reality is we are all born with this sinful nature in us. You say, well, that's just not fair. Why did God choose that? Why did God allow that sin would go from Adam and be imputed on me? I didn't have anything to do with that. Why, did, why couldn't I just be born perfect? Well, that's not your choice. That was God's choice. God is sovereign. God made that decision. God told Adam and gave Adam instructions in which he failed. But you've got to stick with me now because he did provide a way. You, you, you see, he didn't leave it there. The fact that I was born with this sinful nature, he didn't leave it there. There is a way, but let's go back to sin for a second. Because of this infectious sin, because it fills my blood and your blood, we are born with this natural propensity to sin. And if you do not believe that, then you have not raised a child. A child, you teach children to brush their teeth, to bathe themselves, to clothe themselves, to walk, to eat, to use a fork. You teach them all that. You do not have to teach a child to lie. I remember, and I'm not calling her name, but I remember one day I walked into church, and this person knows who they are. We were at, well, we were not in this building. Um, and she walked in, and she grabbed my arm, and she said, I understand original sin. I said, oh, really? Yes. You would not believe what my child did, and I didn't teach him to do that. They will lie. They will take and their neighbor's stuff. I want that, and I don't care if it is yours. I'm going to take it. You didn't teach them that. They were born with that proclivity to sin. Read Psalm 58.3 and see what that says. Uh, that would be a good verse for you to look up this afternoon. So, in the opening, I said this, man does not become, become a sinner by doing evil. Rather, man does evil because he's a sinner. We are born with this sinful nature. There was a, years ago, Minnesota Crime um, Commission did a study and they did a study on children, and it was not a religious study, of course, because this is a secular organization, but they pu published uh, their results. They were looking at, regardless of social economics uh, or social or economic uh, uh, circumstances, uh, they were looking at children and how children impacted as they grew um, the crime rate. And I want to read this paragraph to you. A secular organization. Every baby starts life as a little savage. <laughs> Boy, that's the way you open a paragraph, right? With a commission. And they use the male gender here instead of um, male or female. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants and when he wants it, his bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny these things and he sees with rage and aggression and would be murderous if he, did, if he wasn't helpless to do it. <laughs> He's dirty, he has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children not just certain children, are born, born delinquent. So if, you've never, if you say, I've never had one of my children as a societal delinquent, uh, evidently you have, at least by the Minnesota Crime Commission. If per permitted to continue in, self, in this self-centered world of their fantasy, 
given the free reign of his impulse actions to satisfy his wants, if this was to take place, every child born would end up a criminal. Now, this is the paragraph that was turned into the Minnesota State Capitol from their crime commission on their study of children. So we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And there was lust there for being like God. There was desire there to be like God. And that reality was that all of us were born into sin. You say, well, that's not me. I could not murder anyone. I don't lie. I don't commit adultery. I do good most of the time, and I look good before God. I'm pretty sure about that. But the thing is, is left to our own desires and our human nature, we would fail miserably because we are born in sin. So, the roots of sin come from Adam. The reality is you and I are sinful. So what are the results of sin? Verses 12b through 14a give us that. The results of sin can be summed up in one word, and that's death. Death. Men sin, and they're doomed to die. God said we'd die. We look at Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin are death. That's the first part of that verse. And so while what Paul is telling us in these verses is that death has entered the world through one man's sin, we are sinful because of it. And he even says in this passage that um, not because man broke specific laws and commandments of God um, did death enter the world it was because and through sin because he says from adam to moses there was no law to break but yet man sinned and death entered the world some great reading this afternoon if you want to read a chapter read genesis 5 genesis 5 is a list of people who lived and after every name, it says, and he died. And he died. I mean, the whole chapter is, and such and such lived for this long, and he died. And such and such lived 745 years, and he died. Folks, we don't, we don't want to escape death. God was actually telling the truth. Every second, 1.8 human beings die. Round that up, so just say, Two people every second in the world die. 106 every minute, 6,393 every day, 56 million a year die. And unless Christ comes back and calls us to himself and raptures us out of this place, we all are going to physically die. You won't escape it. You won't. James 1, 14 and 15. You're going to die. It's a reality. It's going to happen. Sadly, though, there's many that do not understand that, or when I say they don't understand it, they don't understand the implications of death without Christ. There are, sin produces three specific kinds of death. In human beings and I want you to hear this because you need to have this in your toolbox when you have a discussion about sin and death you need to have these specific kinds of death in your toolbox to share as people would challenge you on sin and death as it comes to Scripture the first is a spiritual death so the spiritual death is a natural state of all humanity as we are born into, into the world. 
Spiritual death is the reality of being separated from God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you were formerly walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that Satan, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And so Paul is telling the church at Ephesus, telling us that we are born dead in these transgressions. You were formerly living in that before you came to faith in Jesus Christ. So there is a spiritual separation that happens, a spiritual death that happens when we are born without that relationship with Christ. The second is a physical death. And the physical death is just like it sounds. These temporal bodies, these physical bodies that we have will be laid aside. Hebrews 9.27 says, Inasmuch as it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And so this mortal body is going to die. And then the third death is eternal. Eternal death is known as the second death. It refers to not only the eternal separation from the presence of God, which we find in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, and 9, and it reads, Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will, they, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day. But it's not only just separation from God, which is terrible to even consider, but it is also the eternal torment of the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's why I said he, these, this eternal death is known as the second death. And then that, those two verses finish this way. And if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he, she, they are thrown into the lake of fire. And so, eternal death is separation from God eternally and for eternity being tormented in the lake of fire. Every lost person needs to understand that they are spiritually dead, that they will one day physically die, and that if they do not come to Christ as Lord and Savior, they will eternally die. Every saved person needs to understand that you passed from eternal death to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, he provided a way. He did not leave us in our sin, but provided a way for us. Read John 5, and you will see that we will pass from physical death, physical uh, death with these bodies, to live evermore spiritually with God. This second death is not going to be a part of who you and I are as believers in Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to say amen. Because you see, there's a remedy for sin. That's the fourth R. And I'm only going to touch on it briefly because we're going to look at it more in-depthly next week. And that is, Paul tells us in that 14th verse, as he transitions to verse 15, he says that Adam is the figure of him, capital H, that was to come. And he is telling us that Adam is the first type but there's a picture of a second Adam. However, the similarities do not grow or run too deep. 
You see, the first Adam failed, the second Adam prevailed. The first Adam gave a gift to humanity, and that was the gift of sin. Thank you very much. And this gift brought the ultimate price of death. But the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, provided a gift also. And this gift is displayed and spelled out in the following verses in this chapter, verse 15 through 17 and on through 21. In this section, Paul uses the word gift multiple times over and over again for our understanding of what Christ has done, the remedy to our sin. In verse 15, he says that this gift is a free gift. Also in verse 15, he says that this is a gift of grace. In verse 17, he says this gift is a gift of justification. In verse 17, he also says it's a gift of righteousness. God has given us righteousness through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then you remember I quoted verse or chapter 6, verse 23 of Romans, where it says the wages of sin is death, but the rest of that verse tells us that the free gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so there is a free gift of eternal life that is given us. So the remedy for sin and death, what is it? It is simply faith in Jesus Christ. It is coming to faith in Jesus Christ, believing that he was the one that was chosen. He was the one that came for our sins. He was the one that died for my sin, rose to new life, to conquer death so that I could also. This gift cannot be earned. There's nothing that we can do to receive it except receive the gift as we believe in Jesus the Christ. Adam ushered in the reign of death with his sin to all of us. Christ ushers in the reign of life to all who would believe. Thanks be to God for his gift of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to just break open your word and to hear your word preached and read and expounded on. Father, we know that without you, without Christ in our life, we would be dead in our sins, in our trespasses. But Father, through your Son, through his life, we have life in his name. We believe. We believe. And Father, we give thanks that you loved us so that you provided a way out of sin and death to new life in you. Oh, Father, thank you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.